Welcome to week seven for Anthro 32. Glad to see you back. All right, first thing we're gonna do is put on the share screen. And then we will go over, see our lovely homepage for our website. And as you know, you go to the all-in-one schedule and then you can click on the study guide for each week and for this week, week seven. So as we glance quickly down the study guide, see that there's an anthropological concept to learn about. And we have chapter 14, which has uh, information about most of the native nations or tribes in the Southwest. Not all, because later we have a, a, a chapter just about the Navajo and uh, some information about Hopis. Uh, as you can see, we continue to have the uh, yellow highlighted parts for you know, extra good hints. Um, that you'll be learning about, and that will help prepare you for your quiz or test at the end of the week. All right, great. So for this week, we also have a PowerPoint, and uh, that'll help us move along and stay organized. One of the things that um, we uh, that you'll be reading about and that you may already know about if you've traveled in the Southwest, and we're mostly looking at New Mexico and Arizona here, uh, is that it's very dry. Uh, a lot of it is on a high plateau. So quite a bit of it's 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 feet going up towards mountains. Um, the soil is not very rich because there's not a whole lot of area that has been flooded. So if you're in places like the Midwest, the, when the long, long time ago, there would be floods that would go 100 miles wide <laughs> <laughs> and deposit incredibly rich soil on the ground. Um, but in the Southwest, that doesn't happen as much. There's erosion, because you probably heard about the Grand Canyon, <laughs> an incredible amount of erosion. And that rock, rocky, sandy soil washes downstream, but it's not particularly very uh, rich as far as growing things go. And as far as water goes, water comes from the mountains, which are hundreds of miles away from this area, but it will come down uh, and that will be flood a little bit, and there will be some rain. Most of the rain comes in the summer, and it's what's called monsoons in those areas. If you live near a stream or a river, then you could irrigate. So it, long before the Europeans uh, came to the Southwest, for a thousand years, the native peoples were growing vegetables uh, if they happened to live near where there, were, there was water or there was a stream. There's not very many lakes. Uh, in this picture, you can see that the corn uh, that's growing is about 10 or feet or more apart from each other. And this is because this is not being irrigated. There, there's rows that have been put in to help capture the water when it does rain, but this is one of those places where they're dependent on the summer monsoons. Because the soil is not very rich and there isn't enough water to grow crops very well, the Spanish, Europeans, uh, the American peoples thought, we don't really wanna have farms there. It's not a very good place for farming. And it's not even a very good place for grazing animals. You can grow, they do graze cows and sheep there now, but it, it's really overgrazed and it's not really doing very well as far as how many critters you can grow in a particular area. Uh, it's much better further to the east. So the further east you go all the way to the east coast and the further south you go up into the Midwest, all of those native peoples had farmers eventually come and take over that land and force them into uh, smaller reservations or to move west. And some of the people who ended up moving west came here. When you grow certain plants together, it's very, very productive. And the native peoples invented corn. They started off thousands of years ago with the kind of grass that was only, the seed pod was maybe an inch or two long. Archaeologists have found it in um, caves in places like Mexico. So the it, over time, they were gradually able to get this grass to get bigger and bigger seeds until it became uh, what we call corn. Uh, corn actually is a term that means the main food for a people. So in other countries, the corn might be wheat 
or their corn might be barley, but we just call maize, which is this kind of plant on the upper right side here, we call this corn, okay? So the native peoples invented it, and now it, they also it's used all over the world for people to eat the food, uh, animals, chickens, the eggs that you eat, a lot of that comes from the protein that's from corn. And um, you could argue about whether it's a good idea or not, but in this country, a lot of corn is grown just to be turned into sort of a form of uh, ethanol gas. Here we have beans. The beans grow up the corn stalks. Now this is an area where there's a lot of water, it's being irrigated, that's why the corn's so close together. These beans, um, the native peoples also uh, developed and they can be dried and they can give food all through the year. And down here we have squash. Squash are important because they provide uh, big leaves that keep the ground from being baked as much so that it stays moister. It also keeps the weeds out. So they put the three together with the native people called the three sisters and you've got a, a good mix of plants that can keep you alive and uh, make food that can be dried or kept for a long period of time. Um, this is uh, February now when I'm making this video and I'm eating squash that this is a summer squash here, but I have winter squash that I'm eating today that I grew last August because it's like a pumpkin. It has a hard skin on it. If you keep it in the garage or someplace cool away from any mice or anybody else that wants to eat it, it can last months and months and months. And that's what uh, these people did too. All right. Um, one of the things that's in your study guide is mentions, are there sacred places? And for the native peoples, these kinds of features often were sacred and they might have a story that goes with how they were formed. So for example, there's a place in New Mexico I used to live near that's called Shiprock, and it's a 2000 tall, this is an it, but it looks kind of like this. There's a 2000 uh, foot tall uh, bit of rock sticking up out of flat, relatively flat area. And the uh, myth or story that goes with it is that there was a dragon that crashed into the ground and left one of its wings sticking up. So here we have nature, uh, kind of a sacred place. And here we have Notre Dame. Uh, people spent you know hundreds of years building it. And um, uh, it would be the sacred place in Paris. But for how people feel about these places, very similar. Pueblo means um, village in Spanish. So when the Spanish came to the north, you know, the, they were in Mexico. Mexico was part of Spain. And in fact, <laughs> New Mexico, Arizona was part of Spain because that was, you know, so long ago they said, well, we claim it. And they were looking for gold. And here's a representation of the amount of gold that they found in Peru because they went and uh, did all sorts of not very nice things and got a bunch of gold from the Incas, later from the Aztecs. And they came to the Pueblo people in mostly in New Mexico and they thought, okay, well, they probably have gold too. You remember earlier in the semester, we learned about them being crossing the southeast of the United States all the way up towards New Orleans, and they were looking for gold. Okay, now there's these other guys looking for gold and the same kind of uh, MO, if you will, uh, soldiers who are using high-tech equipment compared to what the native peoples had, horses, which gave them a real advantage, uh, guns that uh, make explode and make scary noises and kill people. And they uh, came looking, 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 and there was no gold to speak of. There was maybe a little bit of silver, some turquoise, but not gold. Uh, so they were disappointed about that. And here we have a modern day Pueblo uh, Indian who's um, doing uh, a dance uh, at a Pueblo museum, which is in Albuquerque. And here it is. I've been there, it's really great. One of the fun things about it is that it's run by the Pueblo people, which include a lot of different tribes, including the Zuni. And uh, they uh, tell their story 
um, from their point of view. So when you're there uh, as an Anglo or a white person uh, or a black person or an Asian person, you might think, hmm, they don't seem to really be saying our side of the story. Well, it gives them an opportunity to tell their side of the story. So if you get the chance to go sometime, you should, it's great. This map here shows you, um, I noticed our book didn't really have this, so I decided to show it to you. It has the different Pueblo communities. So up here, you've probably heard of Taos. Uh, it's a great place to visit. Uh, and down through big uh, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, all the way over here, this is actually Navajo country here. Uh, just below it, there's a Zuni Pueblo. In case you didn't know, there's two Las Vegas. There's a little one in, in New Mexico, which is where this is. And there's another one, of course, in Nevada. The book mentions the Hopi, but when, the people who, when you're in New Mexico or Arizona, people typically, when you're talking about Pueblo people, they mean the ones that are here on this map. They're related to other people who have similar kinds of houses and some of the same kinds of beliefs, but there are other tribes such as the Hopi, which are over here in Arizona, okay? Uh, in 1913, the Supreme Court did something that uh, uh, I think was actually a good thing. They said, well, these Pueblo people um, cannot sell their land anymore. Their land is going to be owned by the tribes and you will they will not have to pay taxes on it. And these American settlers that have been coming in and offering all these great deals and trying to grab the land uh, to use for, you know, maybe ranching or something like that, they can't have that land. So that's one of the few cases where, wow, the Supreme Court did a good thing for the Native peoples. And I don't know if at that time people saw it as good because maybe they wanted the freedom to sell it. But definitely nowadays, um, the tribes would say, yes, that was that was a good thing. We still are able to maintain our culture and our land because of that decision. You don't have to read all of this, but um, I thought I would, I just lifted most of this right out of the book and I thought it would be good to include it because I wanted to talk about it a little bit. The Apaches at the moment are spread out all, I don't know if you can see this on your screen very well, especially if you're trying to use a phone, <laughs> but uh, they're spread out from Arizona, New Mexico, a little bit of Texas and down to Mexico. But you'll see that they're this range, they, well, they were traveling around on these horses and they did go all of these different places. But up in here, for example, this had been the Navajo area for a long, long time, but Sure, Apaches, you know, a few hundred years ago, they started uh, raiding here and they were raiding here, <laughs> raiding down into Mexico, and they didn't really come from here. They were up in here, and the Comanche got a hold of horses. There's a little difference between what the book says and what other people say, but the Comanches were really the warriors of the plains that went from all the way down here in Mexico, all the way up to Canada, uh, hunting uh, buffalo, and then later riding their horses and raiding other tribes, as well as uh, American settlers and so on. And they were so aggressive that the Apaches moved this way. And they, Apaches, started attacking the Pueblos and Navajos, sheep and things like that when they could get at them. Uh, and um, they settled quite a bit in here in, in these mountains, White Mountains, and they went into Mexico. So what was the response? Well, the Pueblo Indians fought back, the Navajos fought back, uh, Hopis fought back, uh, the Pima Indians down here that you'll learn a little bit about later fought back. And when they went into Mexico, the Spanish government and then later the Mexican government uh, tried to make friends and say, well, we'll give you food if you agree to, to have peace. And some of the Apache tribes said, okay, and some of them didn't stop the raiding. And finally, um, both the Mexican government and then later the American government said, we're going to kill all the Apaches. And they didn't kill them all. But by 1873, they either were on a reservation and they were 
pacified or peaceful at that point, pretty much, or they were dead. Um, and then in Mexico, same kind of thing that they got chased back up here. So uh, you probably heard of Geronimo. He was one of the last um, warrior chiefs of the Apaches. And uh, the Apaches uh, do have a couple of reservations here and they are um, not doing very well economically as is the case with an awful lot of the uh, different tribes. Uh, and there is problems with alcoholism and unemployment. Here we can see where these Apache, the Apache reservation is. And some of this is pretty nice countryside, some mountains. Here we talked earlier on the earlier slide about some Zunis that were near the Navajo reservation. This part up here is the Hopi. The Hopis have their own reservation. They're, they are kind of modern day cliff dwellers. They have uh, mesas, or which is the Spanish word for table. Uh, they have flat areas that are high, higher than the surrounding landscape where they have uh, villages. And it's kind of like fortified cities in the olden days. They, they, you couldn't get in there unless you know they let you in. And they would go down to the bottom of these cliffs to do their farming. And then if they saw Navajos or Apaches or somebody else that was going to attack, they climb back up to the top of their mesa and they would uh, stay in their fortified place. Um, they have one of their villages is uh, a thousand years old. So they've been in place for a very long time. And if you've heard of Kachinas, well, we'll talk probably about Hopi some more later, but if you uh, heard about Kachinas, they're the ones that make those dolls that represent, they're not supposed to be gods, but they represent the spirits and gods of, of their people. So this is where these Apaches are. The Pima people are down here, Southern Arizona, and they would have about four years of good water where the streams would flood and they would have water for irrigation. And then they'd have about every five years, a bad year but they would grow enough corn and beans and they would save it, protect it, so that they could get through a bad year. Um, this is an example of one of their houses. Uh, they had to be able to survive in really hot weather, 110, 115 degrees sometimes uh, in areas like where Phoenix is in Southern Arizona. And, um, they were able to stay more comfortable. They also had brush huts where they, and so did most of the Southwest Indians, where they'd have poles that go up and down. And then on top, they would pile brush and the wind could blow through underneath, but you would be in the shade. These people, um, because they would have feast and famine, their bodies became very unusual. Doctors have studied this and they are able to eat hardly any food and gain weight, which is really good if you don't have very much food. Uh, it's not so good if you can go to Walmart or Costco and buy big bags of potato chips or other things that are not quite as healthy. Even if you eat regular old healthy-ish food, you know, average kind of balanced diet, you still end up if you're one of these people having trouble, not gaining weight, and diabetes is a really, really bad problem. They have it far worse than uh, other people. The author of our book makes it sound like that's another conspiracy that trying to make them sick. And of course, nobody wants the, the Pima Indians to get sick. It's just more of their metabolism. And it's, um, you know, there are a lot of health professionals that are working with them to try to make sure that the, the diabetes is not get any worse and, and perhaps um, figure out ways to have people eat in a more traditional way and maybe not have the diabetes manifest itself. If you go to Phoenix, you definitely want to take the time to go to the Desert Botanical Garden. They have buildings like the one in the picture here. They have demonstration gardens that show you the kind of gardens that the native peoples used to have there, as well as uh, probably the best collection in the world as for different kinds of cacti. All right, so we're going to go back to our picture here 
And down here is Yuma. So you may have heard of Yuma. A whole lot of food comes from Yuma. Uh, there's water because you see this river comes down through here and they're able to irrigate with because there's water rights. And traditionally, uh, they, the Yuma Indians weren't growing as much food as they as grown there now because they didn't have all the mechanization and so on, but they were able to feed themselves pretty well and in a diet that was similar to what the, the Pima people were doing as far as corn, beans, squash, that kind of thing. They were both growing those things. Um, oh, going back to the Pima, one other thing to mention is that when they were when the U.S. Army came and were fighting with the Apaches, uh, the Pima, some of the Pima tribe people were uh, actually helpful and they worked with the army because they didn't particularly like the way that they were being raided. So it's interesting. So here's how the Pima people used to look. And now there are all different kinds of looking people who are farming in Yuma. And you can see behind this uh, extended family that there's uh, lines of lettuce uh, that have been planted by machine and weeded with machines and then harvested with machines. And Yuma has a tremendous amount of citrus that's grown there, grapefruits, oranges, all that kind of stuff. The Yuma, Yuma Indians were very fierce fighters and you'll read about how they uh, were able to fight off uh, Spanish and Mexicans. At one point they were thinking of becoming friends with the Mexicans and then for a while that didn't work out. And eventually, of course, the US Army, when it got done moving through Arizona to other part of Arizona, came to Yuma and established a fort. All right, so now I'm gonna tell you a little story because it's nice to learn about the culture, not just from somebody telling you, but also to hear what we might call an ethnographics ethnographic story. And this is going to be read by someone else just to kind of mix it up so you don't have to just hear me speaking. Here we go. A Pueblo Indian tale adapted and illustrated by Gerald McDermott. Long ago, the Lord of the Sun sent the spark of life to Earth. It traveled down the rays of the sun through the heavens and it came to the Pueblo. There it entered the house of a young maiden. In this way, the boy came into the world of men. He lived and grew and played in the Pueblo, but the other boys would not let him join their games. Where is your father? They asked. You have no father. They mocked him and chased him away. The boy and his mother were sad. Mother, he said one day, I must look for my father. No matter where he is, I must find him. So the boy left home. He traveled through the world of men and came to Corn Planter. Can you lead me to my father? He asked. Corn Planter said nothing, but continued to tend his crops. The boy went to pot maker. Can you lead me to my father? Asked the boy. Pot maker said nothing, but continued to make her clay pots. Then the boy went to arrow maker, who was a wise man. Can you lead me to my father? Arrow maker did not answer, but because he was wise, he saw that the boy had come from the sun. So he created a special arrow the boy became the arrow. Arrow maker fitted the boy to his bow and drew it. The boy flew into the heaven. In this way, the boy traveled to the sun. When the boy saw the mighty Lord, he cried, Father, it is I, your son. Perhaps you are my son, the Lord replied. Perhaps you are not. You must prove yourself. You must pass through the four chambers of ceremony, the kiva of lions, the kiva of serpents, the kiva of bees, 
and the Kiva of Lightning. Boy was not afraid. Father, he said, I will endure these trials. So the author is showing his illustrations of the boy going through different uh, challenges and for kivas. Kivas are underground ceremonial rooms that the Pueblo people have. They're still used for dances and sacred ceremonies now. When the boy came from the kiva of lightning, he was transformed. He was filled with the power of the sun. The father and the son rejoiced. Now you must return to earth, my son, and bring my spirit to the world of men. Once again, the boy became the arrow. When the arrow reached the earth, the boy emerged and went to the Pueblo. The people celebrated his return in the dance of life. Okay, that was very cool. All right. So thank you for joining us this week for week seven. I look forward to seeing you online, and I hope you have a great week. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye.